2011, with a master's which concentrated on supernatural landscape legends. Um, she's a developing storyteller, and uh, she's just recently finished doing some oral history interviews with Lighthouse Keepers, which connects very nicely with people like from. Yes. Um, so, yeah, this is going to be a brief look at um, some of the strange things that come out of the sea in Orkney Shetland. Um, we've just had a very um, entertaining look at some of the strange things that come out of the sea in Iceland, so I think there will be several points of comparison. Um, and, yeah, it is, I will admit now, it's going to be mostly examples from Orkney, because when I was writing this, I realised that that was what I knew a bit more about. Um, but, yeah, there's the supernatural landscapes in Orkney and Shetland are, make a very interesting study. Um, and partly this is because of the nature of the landscape themselves. Um, almost everywhere that you stand you can see sea, land and sky at once. And this, I think, leads to a very interesting sort of elemental awareness that comes across in the folklore. Um, and also the fact that both Orkney and Shetland have such a well-preserved archaeological record means that time is very visible in the landscape itself. And of course the sea is a very important part of the landscape um, in Orkney and Shetland and indeed um, any sort of island landscape. And just um, to briefly uh, go over some of the theories that I'll be using, um, all place is um, experienced by us sort of in relation to our bodies, uh, because we have nothing else to interpret it with, of course. Um, so all our ideas of where things are, you know, in front, behind, um, left, right, up, down, all of this is very grounded in the physical experience of living in a human body. Um, and you do notice um, in European um, tales and folklore and even literature, you also get the idea that the human body and the physical landscape are made up of the same matter and there's a constant cycle of exchange um, between this matter. For example, if you look at the um, Norse creation myth of Ymir, and I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing that right, um, he has created um, the body of the giant Ymir is dismembered in order to make the physical world in which we live. His skull becomes the sky and his flesh becomes the earth. And there are many parallels um, to this myth across um, Europe and further afield. And this leads to the idea that the human body is also a microcosm of the universe and um, in order for something to be um, in order for a landscape feature to be created, often a body has to be decreated or destroyed and vice versa. So there's a constant cycle of matter going around and nothing can ever be sort of truly created from nothing. Um, and of course, um, as Terry's just been telling us, stories are very important for um, giving us a, sort of a sense of place in the physical world and for sort of putting a sense of, uh, a sense of time and history into the space in which we live. And getting back to the sea, um, which is what um, I'm specifically talking about, um, the sea cannot really be experienced in the same bodily way as the land um, because, of course, we can't stand on the sea, we can't survive in it. So that leads to it um, sort of being conceived of as this mysterious other world. Um, and the roots um, across the sea are, you know, stories are a very important way of sort of mapping where things are. Um, in the sea. Um, time and space are experienced differently on the sea to on <coughs> land. And I'm just going to go through um, a, quick, a quick run through some of the ways in which um, the supernatural is incorporated into the traditional seascapes of Orkney and Shetland. 
The shoreline is, of course, um, a key supernatural location, and it's liminal, um, and it's a boundary sort of for the creatures of the sea and you know us living on land. Um, there's a strong tradition of selkies in Orkney and Shetland, and they do tend to come out at liminal times of either liminal times of day or of year or even um, times of tide. And the classic selkie story is um, it's usually a human man and a selkie woman, um, although there are selkies of both genders and um, there are stories of women sort of purposefully calling up a selkie lover from the sea. If you go to the shoreline at a certain time and you have to cry seven tears into the tide and that will call a selkie man to you, so um, that might be worth remembering later on. <laughs> <laughs> and um, almost always, as Teddy has said earlier, the selkie woman that um, has her seal skin stolen by the man will end up returning to the sea eventually. And um, in Orkney there's quite a strong tradition um, about mermaids. There are not quite so many in Shetland, although there are a few legends of mermaids sort of being pulled out of the sea by fishermen. But in Orkney the mermaids, um, again you get a relationship between the supernatural woman and the human man, but the mermaid is more predatory um, because the legends of Orkney say that um, the mermaid must marry a human man if she wants to stay young and beautiful and if she marries one of her own kind in the sea she will grow old and ugly. Um, so they go out um, looking for human men to drag off of the boats um, and apparently one kiss from a mermaid will make you forget your land um, family and you'll be quite happy to go and live in the sea. Um, and it's said sometimes that the mermaid is actually the um, female equivalent of the fin men. And you get fin men in Orkney and Shetland, but there's actually um, a slight difference to the way that they're talked about in the stories. Um, in Orkney, the fin men are almost like um, fairies of the sea. Um, they're just, they live in the sea, either sort of in this world fin folkahim, which is uh, usually sort of perceived as, as being on the bottom of the seabed or possibly on a disappearing island that you can only encounter at certain times. And they can be um, healing as well. Um, they had a reputation for healing, but you would have to be very nice to them and pay them in silver. And... Um, in Orkney, they're spoken about as actually, you know, being sea men who actually have fins that they wrap around them like a cloak, and they um, also have a bit of a taste for abducting human girls, which is possibly understandable if you assume that there are women folk or the mermaids who are out there dragging men off the boats all the time. So. <laughs> um, but in Shetland, sometimes the stories of fin men, it sounds like they don't specifically live in the sea, um, but they're very sort of supernatural and magician-like people. And there was a, you know, there's a legend of the Finn men in Shetland where the Finn men's sons come home after a day's fishing and they've lost um, the a halibut um, which escaped from them. And the Finn man's father just tells them to get the pot on boiling and leaps out the door. Um, and he's back before the pot has come to the boil, having caught this hell of it, which still has a bit of their spear sticking out of it. Um, so they have a reputation for, an, for well, a definitely supernatural knowledge of the sea and of you know, places um, and navigating the sea. And they're also a bit mixed up with selkies as well, because they're said to have a sort of seal skin coat that they can put on and then become um, a seal as well. And this is possibly linked to the idea of some of the seal skin kayaks that have been found in the isles. Um, and it's suggested that perhaps the Finn men were inspired um, by visitors from the north who actually arrived in the seal skin kayaks and then left again in them. Um, <coughs> and there are also some pretty terrifying monsters lurking on the shores of 
art in Shetland. Um, we don't have any beach creeps in these parts, but we do have something much worse. The knuckle of E. And the knuckle of E is this horrible, it's a horse-man hybrid. Um, with the man just coming up out of the horse's back with no legs. And worse than that, they are totally skinless. And if you are unlucky enough to encounter this on the beach, you can see the horrible black blood pumping around their veins. And it's maybe a wee bit early in the morning to show you a picture of this, but I'm going to do it anyway, so brace yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist putting that one in there. Um, but yeah, the knuckle of E was only a problem in the winter. Um, he was kept under wraps by the mother of the sea in the summer months, uh, which is another, I'll talk a wee bit more about the mother of the sea later. Um, and the knuckle of E was responsible for things like if you lost your sheep off a cliff, that was him. If the crops were ruined by mildew, that was him. And if there was a drought, that was also him. Um, and the interesting thing about the knuckle of E as well is that he was afraid of fresh water. So if you were in the position where you were being chased by him, probably because you were silly enough to be wandering along the shoreline in the dark, possibly after a few drinks, then you would have to find a stream and cross it um, and that would be your way to escape because you could not bear to cross fresh water. <coughs> so these, um, these tales sort of seem to imply that, especially with things like the, the selkies um, and the mermaids, that the worlds of human people and the people of the sea are really irreconcilable at the end of the day. Um, and one or other um, side of, um, of either you know, humans or sea creatures are usually trying to cross the boundaries. Um, and it's not totally one-sided of these creatures wanting to drag us down into the sea because um, there are several men who are very keen to capture a selkie maiden. But um, it never seems to work out long term. Um, and it's... Also um, interesting to note that um, if you're living sort of in very close contact with the sea or on the sea, then you have to work with it or around it. Um, and there are ways of sort of working around the sea. There are lots of um, taboos and traditions. Um, there seem to be a few more of these recorded in Shetland than in Orkney, probably because Shetland did rely a bit more on fishing um, for livelihood than Orkney did. Um, and one of the traditions that I was very pleased to discover was there was a Shetland fisherman who, um, when he caught his first fish of the trip, he would sort of slap the fish about a bit and say, what are you doing here? I didn't want to see you. And it was kind of a reverse psychology thing, thinking that then the fish would come to spite him um, if he thought that they were not wanted. <laughs> Um, and there's also a tradition of um, not naming sort of specific land things like a fire or wife or minister or land animals like pigs, rabbits. You couldn't say these names on a boat, you would have to say something else. Um, and apparently if a young... Um, like if a young boy got these wrong on his first fishing trip you'd get slapped with a wet mitten to teach him not to do that again. So I'm just going to um, quickly <coughs> finish off with telling you about um, one of my favourite stories which is the story of the Mucklemester Stirworm. And this is a story from Orkney um, in which the young hero Asipatl sails down the throat of the monster and, and sets fire to its liver. And as this worm dies, its teeth um, fall out of its mouth. And its teeth create the islands of Orkney, Shetland, and the Faroes. And then it curls up around its burning liver, and this becomes Iceland. And the liver is still burning in there, causing the volcanoes and the hot springs in Iceland. Um, and 
It ties in um, with the myth, um, the Norse myth about Jormungandr, the world serpent, who was another worm said to be big enough to encircle the earth while he was lying in the sea. And Jormungandr is also sort of associated with cosmic forces in Norse myth sometimes. Um, when Thor fights him on his fishing trip, um, it's described as all the ancient earth was collapsing during their fight. And um, the Jormungandr taking his tail out of his mouth was said to be one of the things that heralded Ragnarok. And there are some other tales in which um, a monster is created from, not a monster, um, where land is created from the death of a monster, sorry. Um, there's the Babylonian myth of um, Marduk and Tiamat, um, where the sea already exists as home to the monster Tiamat um, before the land is created. Um, and the sort of the unreadable aspect of the sea as the supernatural other world can lead it to it sometimes being interpreted as primordial chaos. Um, and the monster is sort of the personification of all the creative potential of, um, of the deep and also of the universe. <laughs> Um, and because, as I mentioned earlier, you've got this idea that creation and destruction sort of exist in a constant cycle, um, then the land um, cannot be created without you know, something from the sea being destroyed and vice versa. Um, and you see a sort of... Um, as well as the constant cycle of creation and destruction between the human body and the physical land universe, there's also a cycle of creation and destruction between the land that we live on and the sea, as um, the sea is sort of interpreted as primordial chaos. Um, and it's also just interesting to, to note that um, in these cosmogenies, sort of the um, the land's existence within the sea is as important as the existence of the land itself on its own. Um, so just um, to briefly sum up, um, there, um, most sort of creation legends that we can find are not creation legends as in um, tales of creation from nothing. They are transformation legends of um, existing matter. Um, and I feel that, you know, looking at some of the myths and folklore, you can see a cycle of exchange between the land and the sea in the same way as you can see between the body and the land in many creation myths. Um, and the reason, you know, one of the reasons why liminal zones like the shoreline are so threatening is because they remind us of that instability and that we are constantly part of these cycles and um, that one day it will be us getting decreated in order to make way for something new. Um, and I do feel that Orkney and Shetland are a very interesting place to study this type of folklore because um, the landscapes themselves really do sort of um, hammer this home. I was wondering about the cliffs at Yesnaby a few days ago in Orkney, um, which is where the picture is of there. And you can see sort of sea stacks in the making and um, you can see pits that are about to fall off a cliff. Um, and it really sort of emphasises the fact that um, the physical landscape is not as permanent as it feels to us. Um, when we stand on it. And this rhyme here is um, a rhyme that was apparently said by one of the rare Shetland mermaids when she was caught by some kind of fisherman who let her go. And she um, sends them off like with goodwill, um, muckle good I would ye gay, and may I would ye wish. There's muckle evil in the sea, scoom wheel your fish. Which I thought just, um, kind of sums it up. Thank you very much, Sharon. We've got time for a couple of questions. For the next week, any questions for you? Just 
explain what school means. That's um, not the word I yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that's actually like one of the only times I've encountered that word, but just from the context, I would assume it means sort of scrub, clean, um, so sort of make sure you're not taking any of that sea spookiness back into your homes with you. Any other questions for Eric? Right. Well, in that case.